But over time, things change. And part of what changed was, uh, number one, a very re aggressive reform agenda that, uh, that delivered quick results. Uh, uh, our outcomes improved. The number of kids that were dropping out uh, were reduced. Uh, our enrollment increased for the first time in three decades. And uh, uh, our way of working with the union shifted as well, in part because they proved receptive to some of the some elements of this reform agenda. We closed 26 schools in my first three years in the district, and we couldn't have done that without the union collaborating with us. We move towards mutual consent in terms of the movement of teachers. We, we do not place teachers in schools in Baltimore City un, unless the teacher and the school community wants those teachers there and vice versa. That would not have happened without collaboration on the part of teachers. The local frame around policy matters as well. I have the power of reassignment. So I can reassign any teacher to any school and any principal to any school as well. Uh, and the frame in terms of what's possible about evaluation matters as well. And evaluation is not subject to negotiation in Maryland. And yet, uh, you had a contract that over time had traded very low salaries for teachers uh, for uh, remarkably constraining uh, working conditions. So we moved into this contract and the context of race to the top matter as well. I mean, our negotiation was later than New Haven's, and at that time there were certain things happening around race to the top that dovetail with what we were doing at the local level, where we wanted four things. We wanted a career ladder because we knew that that's what teachers wanted, and in order to get some of the things that we needed, it was important that uh, we had a shared interest around certain, something that's very important. So we, we've now, as a result of the contract, moved towards a four-tier career ladder where movement in terms of the ladder is tied to evaluation. And on the race to the top in Maryland, evaluation is tied to student outcomes. So uh, as a function of how we're defining the profession, uh, we got the linkage between uh, 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 what happens in terms of the profession and outcomes which we wanted, wanted at the start. Secondly, we push past the question of effectiveness from evaluation to compensation by uh, ending seniority and steps and tying the movement within the ladder to the evaluation. Thirdly, uh, we wanted school-based options for every single school. And this is where the theory of action matters, because our theory of action in uh, Baltimore was slightly different, or maybe a lot different than the theory of action in New Haven, which is that we believe that uh, autonomy was a trigger for capacity. So we wanted to give every school autonomy within a frame. We had shifted resources to the schools already. And what we wanted was a frame of accountability that was tightly aligned with what was happening around operations already. So the contract gave us over three years the movement towards every school being able to negotiate, in essence, the working conditions at the school level with a, with a super majority and huge safeguards around whether this is really what teachers wanted. And the charters, and again, context is everything, uh, uh, nearly 15% uh, of my kids are in charters. Uh, and uh, the charters are under the district umbrella. So this, this, this frame of, of schools having great flexibility was, was very much part of the conversation at the school level. Finally, in order to make all these things work, we needed to create a frame of collaboration moving forward that was going to ensure sustainability no matter what was happening in the district. So we built into the contract these uh, frames, and we, we borrowed a great deal from New Haven in terms of the approach to parking lots, to making sure that people were uh, deeply 
engage in the process of answering some of the hard questions that we had not gotten uh, uh, gotten to in the context of the negotiation. Uh, those were the four key elements, and we got them all. Uh, the question of, I think I still have a minute. I'll give you a minute. OK. The, uh, 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 the question of implementation, of course, is, is huge. It's all about implementation. I mean, so much of this conversation is about vision and dichotomies. It's all about how well you do the job at some level. Uh, so part of the deep work has been about making sure that, that we have stepped away from the negotiation into the work without missing a beat. And I can uh, uh, very gladly say that, that the negotiation stopped the moment that the contract got ratified. And it became, about, uh, 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 it became about getting the work done. The contract was not ratified on the first go. It was ratified on the second go. And uh, uh, that, to me, was always a signal of how serious it was, because it was serious enough that we had to work unbelievably hard to convince teachers that, it, that this is exactly uh, what needed to happen. Uh, but uh, right now, it's, it's working beautifully. And in the context of Race to the Top, for example, uh, where we're all struggling with the definitions of effectiveness, uh, we're not having s that discussion in Baltimore, in, par in part because you have you know, scores of teachers who are really engaged in uh, defining what needs to happen for us. Uh, the, the state frame, of course, is going to drive everything moving forward. But uh, anything that's not defined, then we're, we're trying to define ourselves. So I, I want to jump in uh, there and, and welcome Randy. Um, and uh, before I kick it over to Randy, let me just follow up a little bit on, um, on what each of you have just said. You know, clearly. That's, that's the review for me. That's right. <laughs> um, both of you have just described a negotiation uh, process a little bit and, and the, what you were looking for, what you got out of it. Um, the first thing that you know, they teach you in the Harvard negotiation program in going into a negotiation would be think about what your opponents or your, the other party, um, what their best alternative is if you can't make a deal. Um, and try to make their best alternative worse than, than the outcomes that you would get from the deal itself. And so I would just like each of you to Talk a little bit about, did you, and because I, I certainly know of some things um, in the New Haven context, but what did you do to try to strengthen your hand? Um, because you've both sort of said that this is, um, as much as you were trying to create a collaboration, this is in reality, uh, there's a lot of things at issue. There's a fundamental conflict uh, that you're trying to negotiate around. I wasn't on the negotiating team, but I was briefed on a weekly basis. Um, I, I don't think they went in like you do with normal negotiations. Uh, this, these were side contracts that were done, um, pretty much leaving the language and so forth of the other contract intact. Uh, the negotiating team started off with a list of beliefs, I think, that set the tone for the entire negotiation sessions. Um, do we believe that New Haven kids should get more out of teaching relative to their learning, and everybody agreed, yeah, we can do a better job with that. Uh, do you believe every kid can, can learn? Yes, we do agree to that. And that set the tone, in my opinion, because you could always go back to why are you making that point if you believe that every kid can learn? And, and that's the way that they started um, this negotiation. So once you got in the room, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I had a different perspective. As an advocate, this is before I was on the board. I was up in the state capitol, and I didn't know what happened in these rooms, but I saw some very tense stuff happening with the New Haven legislative delegation. And you know, I got the impression that one of the things that happened was around this idea of local charter schools yes. and creating non-unionized schools, as a, um, and that there was a legislative effort around that that ultimately did not move forward but that that actually had a significant impact on setting the frame for what the alternative was if, if the district didn't get a deal that, that ended, sort of the deal that ended up happening. I think it was just clear. I don't, I don't think charter versus non-charter was an issue. There was an issue, as I mentioned earlier, about whether there would be a union or not. Mm -hmm. so, so that didn't, in my opinion, make you know, uh, 
any impact or have any impact on what was taking place yeah. in that room. When we decided to back off of the fact that there would not, you know, be any changes with the way our union operated, I think that opened the door there for, for the yeah. rest of the things that took place. And Andres, you, your negotiation took place in the context of race to the top. Yeah. Was that a big factor for you? A uh, big factor in the sense that there were certain things that we might have had to negotiate that we didn't because we all understood that we had already had gained that in the context of what the application was going to be about. And B, uh, BTU, uh, uh, which is the only AFT affiliate in the state of Maryland, was, I believe, one of only two uh, locals in in the state that sign on to the race to the top application the uh, we in the same way we did not go into the negotiation thinking of the union as the opponent uh, we uh, and the fact that we could laugh about New Haven plus is sort of s symptomatic of that which is that uh, uh, we there had been an arc in the relationship over time where the union felt invested in some of the progress in the district. There had been a recognition that the administration had tried to give recognition and credit to teachers and had actually tried to safeguard teachers in the context of, of tremendously declining resources. Uh, and they, there was an agreement that we were not going to use the word impasse throughout the negotiation. We were going to try to work it through, and we were going to keep it uh, uh, behind closed doors to the extent that there was going to be conflict. We were not going to negotiate in public in order to allow us to continue negotiation. Uh, and then the two negotiating teams, and like Dr. Mayer, I was not on the negotiating team expressly because I felt that I, I could be a, a strong uh, influence in terms of keeping certain things coming. The two negotiating teams were good negotiating teams that developed through the negotiations, which took nine months, uh, 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 a, a, a shared set of interests that they started with and then that they expanded it. So certain things that were hard fought at the beginning uh, ended up being things that, that uh, you know, our team went with or their team went with. And uh, again, the fact, that, the fact that the first ratification was, was, did not happen was a sign of how much room had, how much room had developed because uh, you know we went out there with something that was really radical in the context of Baltimore and it took a lot of convincing for people to sign off on it which was a sign of how serious it was how much the union gave uh, and and on our part how much we invested we were on this notion of, of a, a professional uh, investment in the professionalism of teachers as, as part of an ongoing uh, uh, not just an ongoing, the ongoing thrust of the work in the district in terms of improving what's happening in the classroom. So I want to give uh, Randy an opportunity to weigh in here and, and um, in response to a, a particular question, which is, you know, um, some critics of the New Haven deal early on um, suggested that because there were significant pay raises involved for teachers, I think it was 3% per year in an environment where, you know, most folks could see that the budget situation was getting worse and worse, that this was not replicable, um, uh, and that you know you have to buy reform. Um, I think the pay increase in your deal was only four and a half percent over three years. Um, but you know, I think it's not talked about much, but as you pointed out, in DC, the deal was even more than that. It was uh, by different calculations, maybe as much as 20 percent over the course of that deal. So I, I would love for you to comment on the national context of what 20, you see. 22 percent. You said. would probably know. Um, <laughs> so I'd love for you to talk about that issue and then if you like use that as an opportunity to talk about how, what you see the national uh, significance of what's the deals that have just been made in New Haven and in, in Baltimore. So I was involved in both of the, not at the bargaining table, but involved in both the Baltimore and New Haven deal and the Washington DC deal and the Detroit deal and umpty ump others that people now view as progressive contracts. I'm going to say something that's going to get all of you mad, including the, the gentleman up here. 
you are all looking at collective bargaining so totally the wrong way. And if you keep on looking at it this way, you're not going to get real education reform in America, period.